Hey Skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. Yeah, I'm Bob, how's it going? Welcome to our first 2024 frontside ski comparison. I know a lot of people have been looking forward to this one. I mean, the reality of it, and I feel like we've been doing a better job at dealing in reality yeah. over the past few years. Yep, I agree. Really ever since we got on that Thunderbird, which we'll get to in a minute, but yeah, this is kind of the majority of what people ski most of the time. Totally. It's the right tool for the job for a lot of skiers. Yep. Yeah, and Thunderbird, I agree. That ski is responsible for at least uh, reinvigorating my perception and opinion of this category. Yep. Like, it, it, uh, I keep, I constantly think about that day with JG. Right. He's like our snowboard consultant. And we were both skiing Thunderbirds, and JG was snowboarding. And, like, that was like, it seemed like he could relate to that style skiing more than like when we normally are out there with him. Yeah. So he was like, you guys are like making some cool turns. That looks like yeah. a lot of fun. It was visually very yeah. uh, like different for him. Totally. Seeing us on that. So. Yeah. So it was nice getting that, that perception. Yeah. Um, and now I, yeah, I kind of got to like view carving through right. the lens of a <laughs> snowboarder. And I was like, whoa, you're right. Like this yeah. is really cool. Yep. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of great skis in this category. Um, I was thinking back to, I believe it was the mid-100 free ride comparison when we were, I was questioning whether there was a 1,000 gram difference in weight. Yep. Was that the free ride? I think it was. Like a, a backland yeah, it was, 10, I don't know. I remember. Anyways. Backland um, 107 to a... A heavy ski, yeah. the Cochise. Right, Cochise I think that's what, that's what it was, yeah. I think. Um, this wall, or this comparison, is interesting because we've got to be gosh darn close to a $1,000 difference. Yeah. From a ski like the Stance 80 to, say, this Montero AX, if it came with a binding. I mean, the AS comes with a binding, so that's right up there, too. Yeah, so... Big range in prices and, and a big range in uh, skier appropriateness, I think. Yep. There's less of a range in like true performance differences up here, although there are some, but I think really the big difference is like skier ability level, stuff like that. Yeah, and we've had a few requests uh, mainly based off of like when we do a sneak peek for Top 5 Fridays. Yep. People are wondering about like, Mogul performance yep. from this I did, crowd. So, I did see some questions about mogul performance. Like, I'll try to bring yeah. it up. If I don't bring it up, it's basically not applicable. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was just going to say, wherever relevant, we can yeah. definitely talk about mogul performance. Um, and the way that we have this grouped is basically going narrowest to widest, and then like within that grouping, Bob, you had some profound thoughts on how you organize things. Yeah, and it's easy to see with the 82s because... These are all 82s yep. from this side over. So uh, within the, a certain width of ski, then we're going easy to hard. Yeah, less demanding to more demanding, Yeah, something like that. So with that said, I think we can get started unless you've got anything else you want to add. I do not. On with the show. Okay. Well, you're going to start us off here. Do we need our scale? I don't think so. Because I've just the... noticed that it's, it's um, well, definitely not, not on the floor. Let's get it. And just in case. Just in case, but you know, these these systems are not light. It's tough. It's you not know, yeah, it's not as black and white. When you're getting into something at this level, weight isn't nearly as much of a consideration as it is in other zones. Yep, so I agree. It's it's not a huge point of emphasis. Obviously, uh, a Blaze eighty two is gonna be on I the lighter side. I think that's where things might get interesting. Some of these flat yeah. skis we can take a look at weight. Yeah. Um, at any rate, this is an Atomic Redster Q7. Um, Redster, there's a lot of them. It, it's kind of like when you get to the 7 and 9 level, you're starting to see that top end of performance. And then uh, the, the letter basically indicates what build it is, what style it is. So yeah, I think that accurately described it. It's a little difficult, but this is before the... Q9 because it uses a carbon Revo shock laminate as opposed to 
uh, steel or titanol. I'm, I can't remember which material it is, but uh, basically the damping properties of this ski or the damping layer is lighter and a little bit more flexible. So you're getting just a little bit easier accessibility uh, into this Q7. Uh, these are the narrowest skis on the wall. We tried to break it at 76, but uh, these at 75 just made sense to put yeah, them in here. So I agree. A uh, couple of outliers just at the start with these 75 millimeter underfoot skis. Um, and the way I like to think about these Q7s, I'm going to get it wrong at some point, but Q7s, easy to turn, sharp, crisp, and pretty accessible. Once yeah. you get into Jeff's ski, that Q9, you start to see just the dampness start to pop up, a little bit heavier, uh, and then an upgraded binding. And not to step on your, your toes with your That's ski. That's okay. But, uh, you know, they are, they are pretty similar, and we will run into similarities um, you know, Alon and, and some other things as well where there's not as huge of a gap, but there's certainly a different skier. This is a more moderate speed skier, someone who's making a variety of turns more on the short to medium radius side of the spectrum. Yeah, we're in the 14s, right? If Four this is a 168. We are 14.2 meter turn radius. Yeah, so. we'll see a lot around 15 in this group. Um, and it's pretty stiff. And there's very active camber. Yeah. So like, that's where we're seeing a lot of differences within this range, is that very active camber and no rocker. I mean, 100% cambered ski, and we see that in taper shape as well. So some of these skis are a little bit more uh, free flowing. Even something like a Deacon 76 Master that we have there does have tip and tail rocker, even though it's a more rugged build. So we do see some variances, but this one falls onto the fully cambered side of the spectrum. Longer effective edge, smoother the turn, and this thing is just a whole lot of fun. Uh, just takes it down a notch from your upcoming ski in the Q9. You yep. know, we do have that metal laminate through here as well. You know, same wood core, powerful wood core. Uh, and just really holds an edge from tip to tail and not overly demanding. But a lot of skiers that like a fully cambered ski are really going to gravitate towards something like this, especially if you're you know, looking to use it in an all-day format and you're not terribly confident as to your physical abilities. Yep. You know, stronger skiers will get along better with what you've got coming up next. But. Yeah, I think you nailed it with like skier strength and then like uh, general preference for speed. Yep. You know, like if you're not skiing really fast, then that's great. Yep. It's very responsive. It's very precise. It does all the things that like a high-end carving ski should. Yeah. And it's just a little bit easier. Yeah. That's kind of, that's the point. You know, it's not everyone has a race background. Right. And so that's where something like that, where you have a, a very similar shape with two skis, but one of them is slightly more accessible. Yeah, or you're maybe you're getting older, slowing down, yep. something like that, but you still want the same like overall feel that you've benefited from and enjoyed in in a precise frontside ski. Then I think this is awesome. Yep. And like, it was. I mean, you could you can vouch for this. Like when we were going through these skis and kind of like refreshing our, ourselves, or more me refreshing myself. <laughs> like I I was. It was nice to get a reminder that this is a, a real ski. Right. Because I think when you look at the Redster line, like you were saying, there's so many skis in the Redster line that when you get down, which I think is fair to say, like you have to move down in the catalog physically to reach this ski. When you move that far down, it's easy to think like this is not much ski. But no, yeah. there's a lot going on here from a technology perspective and a performance perspective. It's just, yeah, I think it's just better at moderate speeds. No, it's a great point to just think visually that there's, I don't know, almost 10 skis that are above Above, it. like yeah. quote unquote above. Yeah. yeah. It's like, a lot. It, it is a lot. And that's probably excluding fist skis. Right. So if you add in those, then it's like 20 yeah. before you get to the Redster <laughs> Q7. But still a great ski. Um, moving up to the Q9 here. So like Bob was saying, it's basically the same exact ski. In this this iteration, I feel how much heavier that is. I even can though see you pick them up over there. Even though it's, it's shorter. Yeah. So in this iteration, we get Revo Shock S, so that 
metal clad Revo shock, which I do think there's a noticeable difference between those two things. I do think this provides more vibration damping, but again, that's the, that's the type of thing that you're only benefiting from at X speed and above, right. whatever that X is, probably getting pretty darn close to like 40 miles an hour. Um, and then this, this ski really does have a, a significantly different binding system. And we've looked at this before, I think my favorite thing about this binding system is how it sits in this track. So with a ski like this, 75 underfoot, obviously edge angles and, and kind of like dictating leverage and forces, yeah. it matters quite a bit. And I've, I've always enjoyed that for those that are achieving a high edge angle, if you're really driving the ski, it feels like there's like one extra point of connection between you and the ski because you're not just like pushing there's a little bit of like pulling up yeah. on your outside edge and I just think that's really cool um, it's really not like noticeably stiffer than the Q7 I think no. like where you it feels that way because it's a little shorter totally and a little more of a dead spot underfoot yeah but really where you where you feel the difference is in its its weight and then that vibration damping we had a media shoot that they are watching some of the footage of right now. And we had uh, John McIntosh, who we've referenced before, great skier, uh, like longtime Alta local. And I'd say it's fair to say that he's slowing down now. Yep. He was skiing the Q7. And uh, our one of our atomic reps, who is a big, strong guy, uh, race background, he was skiing the Q9. Yep. And it's like, just watching that footage, it's a pretty good representation of what type of skier is going to benefit more from, from each ski. If you're big and strong and heavy, then I would venture a guess that you're going to prefer this, but that also kind of comes along with, like, you should be skiing pretty darn fast, too. And we, we mentioned moguls at the beginning of this comparison. I would say neither one of these skis is particularly good in moguls. Not, a, not applicable. Yeah. I it's, mean, if I had to choose one, I would choose the Q7 because yep. it's yeah. lighter, but neither one to me is, is really very good at all off trail. Yeah. And mm. like, that's fine. 75 underfoot. Like, right. It's built like a race ski. Yeah. Yeah. Atomic's the same company that makes the entire bent collection. Right. So this ski is not. And like, they've got the 7.8 and 9.8 versions of these skis, which if you want this style skiing experience, but you want to go off trail, you can just move to those skis in a little wider. Yeah. And width isn't everything, you know, we'll, we'll see some skis through here, like Stance 80 is probably the closest one to me that does great off trail. Yeah. So shape plays into it too, but with a ski like this where it's pretty stiff, pretty narrow, and with a front side focused shape, I think it's best as a front side ski. I agree 100%. And as it's our narrowest on this wall, that just kind of keeps it more in that in that category for sure. Yeah, and I think like just in general, kind of speaking to comparison or the comparison side of this comparison, I think this ski is, it's right there with things like the Thunderbird. Yep. Um, maybe not the Deacon 76 Master, but the non-Master Deacon 76. It's a very similar, like rewarding skiing experience. Yeah. Rally, you know, all these skis are, are pretty close together in, in waist width. And I just think they all have like, that super precise, quick edge-to-edge -edge performance that's that's really fun for a frontside ski. Yeah, and I think I like, I've been using the word planted a lot lately. Yep. Like skis that are fully cambered like that, that have that solid underfoot feel, have that more planted feel. And we'll even see that up here. You know, Fisher is one of the ones that kind of brings that to light in the, in the wider yep. section. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. skis that like to be engaged but on the snow pretty specifically yeah and i would say q9 feels pretty darn planted yeah you know like i'd, I'd say like thunderbird is a little different it's yep. like less planted yeah. it's more responsive yeah. and like snappier and like that's it, one of the reasons why like i i i won't speak for you but like why i would gravitate towards the thunderbird as my own ski just because that sure. fits my style a little bit better yeah yeah I think we've all been excited about this one. We've certainly 
heard about it in the comments. This is the all new Stokely Montero AS. Uh, and we got on this thing last year uh, and we're pretty amazed at how they possibly make a ski like the AX, but make it that much quicker. This is our foray into 76 millimeters now. So it's interesting now they have Montero AS at 76, they got the AX at 80 and the AR at 84. So they share constructions and they share general footprints, but they're just scaled down. Yeah, and then slightly shorter turn radius here, but yeah. I wonder if people have a false perception of this ski from turn radius. Because the S, the S throws me off. Like, I feel like it's going to be 12. Right. But this one is, in you know, a 172, this is a 14.8 meter turn radius, which isn't quite slalom. Right. But in the catalog, like, AS, I believe, stands for all mountain slalom. I thought it just meant short. I think it means all mountain <laughs> slalom. Um, and then for reference here, the 173 AX is 15.5. So it's not yeah. like a world of difference, but I agree. Like this feels, this feels m more quicker than I would expect from the difference in turn radius and a four millimeter difference in waist width. Yeah, I found it to be pretty relative in terms of the movement from AR to AX to AS. Yes, I think that's I good think sequential. It, I think it's an equal yeah. change. Yeah. Um, so, and that's kind of what we've always talked about when people are asking to compare AX to AR, and it's like, it's a very, very similar feel. Yeah. You're, the AR is just more comfortable in longer radius turns and at higher speeds, whereas it gets, the comfort level just gets to more of the mid-range as you go to the AX and then the short range here in the AS. Yep. Uh, so that's really the only difference is it, the ski's level of comfort in different turn shapes and styles. Um, this one comes with the color match strive binding, which we didn't, we elected not to put on, but it looks pretty darn sharp. You know, we've seen it in, in the AX and the AR as well. And from a visual perspective, it's, it's great. And, you know, nothing wrong with the binding at all. Certainly helps to have that, that system. Doesn't really improve performance over putting, a, you know, you have a pivot on your AX I do. and you could put any other type of marker race binding or whatever on this thing. But I was going to even say like, well, I guess the brake width is an issue. You could put like a royal family marker binding on yeah. there. It's like, again, like the brake width is kind of the biggest factor the, there. But The toe starts to get a little wide, like the yeah. AFD, but... Um, no, I think that I think that the, the strive makes sense and just keeping it more light. Yeah. Like that's kind of the benefit of this and what I found to be the most fun was yeah. just really being able to snake those quick turns. I think through. it's nice having a low stand height on any yeah. Montero too, where yeah. a lot of the skis up on this wall, like it's great that you're picked up off the ski, it gives you more leverage, but the, the skis themselves are so supple and smooth that like being really close to the ski is, yeah. at least for me, it's really nice. Um, same construction applies here with the light wood core, two sheets of metal, our favorite rubber dust and the, and the adhesive laminates. So it very much has that AX and AR Montero feel to it, um, just in that, quicker, in that quicker format. And it comes through in the profile as well, where we're seeing this super long camber you know, this is exactly what we'll see when we take a look at that AX, where it's long, long camber. You know, in in Stokely's world, this is like tip rocker. But yeah, totally. Not in, not in really a, anyone else's world. Progressive tip but shape. Yeah, that's their super progressive tip shape. Yeah. Uh, but really, when we look at the look at all that tail rocker, Jeff. That's a lot of tail yeah, rocker. That's a lot of tail Compared rocker. Compared to the uh, Atomics, which have the yeah. same shape tail, which you said is no tail rocker. Right. It's funny the <laughs> the difference. Yeah, um, and then the other uh, just construction thing is the flex torsion control. Yeah. So, you know, they cut slits in that upper sheet of metal here, and it really just helps the ski stay planted on the snow. Yeah, really, like, you got to go all the way down there to that declivity to yep. see a similar construction technique. Yep. Uh, I will bring Mogul Performance into this ski as it does have that, little bit softer of a shovel. So if you're looking to drive your tips into the moguls and have that nice quick edge to edge release, uh, this is amazing. 
And because it does have that nice, smooth, quiet, stokely feel, it just, it doesn't get deflected. Yeah. You know, the, the skis really follow where your boots are pointing them. We still are getting that same stokely precision and quality uh, and just a very smooth overall ski, but still like incredibly sturdy. Yep. You know, that's really the best thing about these skis in general is just how quiet they are. Um, didn't feel a whole lot under my feet skiing them. Uh, I think, I could be wrong, but I think this was <laughs> the size that I had to ski and a little short for me. But the, the most time that I spent on that ski this past season was also in like slightly more variable snow conditions yeah. than I would have ideally hoped for. Um, so I'm actually like excited to ski it again, right? You know, on like on those like perfect Perry Merrill mornings, like that's where I feel like that ski is really going to shine. Yeah, I I'm curious too if I get on a longer one, and start to open it up a little bit, where that comfort level for someone my size is going to diminish. I think you're going to find that that break point sooner than later. And as since I'm accustomed to the AR. In the that's, 185. That's yeah. That's yeah. kind of why I feel that way. Yeah, and I'm not going out there with the same expectations. So no. I think you got to kind of temper. temper no, that. and yeah, I think a little. It, it, I think it's very fair to say that um, although you brought up mogul performance, I think like AX and AR are more versatile skis. Yeah. Like this is this is a little bit more focused on just that edge to edge quickness and short turns and responsiveness on a groomer. Where like those are those are great all mountain skis. Right. And, like, you know, I also generally defer to your mogul expertise over mine, but to me, that's a better mogul ski, the AX. Yeah, I would probably I would probably choose that if I were entering a competition, a mogul competition yeah. over yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. So, makes sense. Yeah. Just a little bit more stability. A little straighter, you know, yep. obviously it's a marginal difference, but a little straighter, a little wider, I think just a little bit more forgiving when you're not on a perfectly manicured, groomed slope. Um, and then here's that ski that we kept referencing as kind of helping reinvigorate our enthusiasm for this category. This is the Thunderbird R15 from Blizzard, um, largely the same ski that it's always been, although they've like, they've ticked it up up a notch or two in terms of its like true ceiling. Yep. Um, something that I think is interesting is this ski used to share the same footprint with the Firebird HRC and the Firebird HRC was closer to like World Cup construction leaving this like more consumer but like skiing them back to back they were really 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 similar so so much so that it was legitimately hard for me to yep. like truly differentiate between the two per, for performance and they've since changed that Firebird HRC. So now like it puts this ski in, in more of a singular position in Blizzard's line or at least it's it's more clear who should be choosing it and who should be choosing it is someone that wants like an awesome awesome frontside ski that's a little wider than a true race ski. 76 under foot um, but I at least find that it has a lot of similar properties to those firebirds it's yeah not, it's not too many steps behind no and I, I like how they did it they even came out with the r13 this year right which is a shorter turn version of you know if they're if we're simplifying things this is the gs thunderbird and sure. the r13 is the slalom sure but this is a 15 meter radius yeah. hence the r15 um and it's just Super, super fun. I think there's like a lot to be said about the 15 meter and shorter turn radius, which like is it's most of them, evident yeah. in a lot of these yep. skis because it, it just comes across the fall line so easily. But like this is a stiff, strong, powerful ski. They've got this active carbon armor that I think stiffens it up even more throughout the mid body. It's a real binding system, you know, it's an XL binding on here now. It's like the true race yeah, binding. That's the that's the upgrade for yeah, for this year for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's not like a a race plate. It's not like we're drilled into a piston plate here or screwed into a piston plate, but yeah, this is a this is a very high-end binding system and I don't know. I just find the Thunderbird R15 works so well cuz I've never 
I've never reached a point where I have pushed it too hard. I don't, I don't think I even have that ability, but it's, it's easier to get to that super rewarding like experience as a front side ski on this than it is for me on Deacon 76 master. Yeah. Um, even rally, I think like there's something about this Thunderbird that just like it's easy to achieve, and maybe it's the True Blend wood core. Like they are yeah. doing some cool things with how they're controlling stiffness in different portions of the ski, and as a, as a single entity, it is very stiff, but you can feel a little bit more suppleness in the tip there. So if I had to point to one ingredient that makes me feel that way, I suppose I would point to True Blend. I, yeah, I agree, and I think it's just a little bit more open and willing yeah. versus your your rally point there, yeah. where they're very similar the, skis on the, paper. Yeah, the rallies it's a little more closed minded. Yeah, you know, this is a little bit more liberal in terms of accepting your input and and like input or lack of input. Right, like it, this ski can relax a little bit more than I think something like a rally can. Yeah, but you know, you also get trade-offs like I would say that that if we're talking about true performance ceiling like maybe the rally ticks a notch higher yeah so but like I said like I don't think I've ever found a limit here for myself no. maybe in speed because it is you know shorter turn radius it's not just gonna run but like nothing up here really is what, much over 17 meter turn radius? Well, maybe this Brahma 82. Even that. I think even that's a shorter 16.5 is my guess. Yep, you're right. What do I win? It's not a guess. You knew. Fair enough. <clears throat> my educated guess. My very educated guess. This might be the straighter of but the But anyways, group. like we're not going to see. There aren't many yeah. skis in this range. This is 18 and a half. There you go. So that, that must be the longest one. Though. I think so. But yeah, I mean, you can ski this really, really hard. It just, it won't make like a super G turn because right. it is a, a shorter cut. Yeah. And if you do want it to go faster, you kind of have to adhere to a lower edge angle. And that's, I found that to be true about yeah. rally as well. Yep. I think really a lot of these skis, um, just ski a flatter ski and let it let it run. Yeah. Plenty stable. Plenty of strength. Totally. Yeah. No, that's and that's like I don't actually think that anybody was overlooking this ski because of the Firebird HRC, but it would like I would get hung up on it. Like just kind of looking in the catalog. But like right. this is this is really all all you need. I would much rather ski that than the old HRC on a daily basis. You right. Know, here in Vermont for sure. Right. It's just a, it's a more pleasant experience. Totally. Whereas something like this is a little bit more demanding, but they do make concessions. Um, this is a Vocal Deacon 76 Master. Um, so we have had this Deacon 76 shape around for a few years now. Um, the regular 76 has uh, Vocal's multi-layer wood core, and then it uses their R-Motion binding system. This ticks up the ash to the ash wood core, very much more of the actual race room build. Um, ash wood core, two sheets of metal. So this is where we're seeing, you know, a very, very sturdy and strong ski start to come into play. Yep, piston um, plate compared to yep. the ski that we just looked at. Yeah. Integrated so, system. And tailored carbon tips here as well. So we're taking cues from Vocal's other skis and incorporating them into here. Um, so that carbon really makes the initiation phase extremely quick and precise. And that's kind of the nice thing about it. Um, so with that heft and that plate, uh, the concession to keep it out of race room is putting a little bit of rocker in here. So, yeah. you know, we kind of made fun of Stokely for their rocker profile, but like... There's not much in that. There's not much, but it, it, when we decamber it, it starts down here. You know, and we'll see that with Deacon. That's kind of a, just a current theme. You know, it's, I don't know, two millimeters of rocker, but... It's kind of like a, it's an ever-present vocal concept right now. I know, now. where I, they just kind of are helping the initiation phase. It's, I wouldn't say it does anything for softer snow, you know, maybe helps it ride a little bit, but... I don't, I don't think so. I don't think that I was an intent. No, and like... 
Yeah, I don't think the masters have any soft snow application. No. I don't think the non-masters do either. Um, maybe a good opportunity to say, like, we didn't, for whatever reason, never had an opportunity to point a camera at that ski, but we do have the non-master version on camera, so being the same shape will yeah. we'll include some of that. Um, I'd say that ski actually does better in soft snow. That ski is a little bit more in the Thunderbird realm. Yeah. Um, and just slight tail rocker. You know, you can, it's, it's slight, but it's there. And 17.6-meter yep. turn radius, so a little bit longer, a little bit more into that GS style, you know, where we have the 72 Master as well, which is narrower, and that, again, kind of fills the shorter turn, more medium turn slots in Vocal's lineup. But certainly you get the, the most race-like feel as it is constructed closer to that FIS ski than... I think anything we've seen so far. And and anything that we will see going forward. Yeah, you are correct. Yeah, so it is. If you truly want race-like performance, but in a wider ski, yeah. that's that's great. Um, and we've, like, we've, we have a lot of experience with Deacons and Deacon Masters, and there, there really aren't that many people that need the Master. It's yeah, very similar yeah. to what we were just saying about Thunderbird versus Firebird. Like, and you were just saying, like, I'd much rather ski that Thunderbird on a daily basis than a Firebird HRC. Yeah. I can't help but feel the same way about Deacon versus Deacon Master. Like, I appreciate what this does that yeah. the Deacon 76 non-Master doesn't do particularly as well. But when, when am I benefiting that from that, like less than one percent of my time on the hill yeah and and that's a great point because this this wall is a lot about percentages yeah and what's going to maximize your your enjoyment most of the time yeah so yeah this is a a lower percentage ski in terms of usability right whereas it's and i think that's kind of a a scale where your usability goes down as your build goes up yes so but uh, there are skiers out there that want the best of the best yeah. build and like the top 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 tier performance and and that's where that ski lives yeah and pretty impressive when you get on like that full ash core ski it's Just pretty how, amazing how strong it is yeah it can take you for a ride too yeah i've had some i've had some sketchy experiences <laughs> on skis like that in my lifetime um and then a new ski here from rosignol the forza 70 uh we talked about this ski quite a bit um, last season, 62, the 60 could have been on this wall. Yeah, yeah, it could have been. The four is a 60, so maybe we'll talk about the four is a 60 a little bit right now. Um, but this is kind of a whole new thing for Rosignol, um, and that's, to me, best reflected in that name, the 70. So 70 refers to, like, the degree of edge angle that you're supposed to be able to achieve yep. which I just think is is so fun um, and then really like talking about frontside skis and talking about frontside performance the Forzas are much different than something like a Deacon Master because they are really not focused on feeling like a race ski at all like Rosignol has their whole hero collection and uh, they have their masters beyond it this is another ski that's right. like 10 down from the top of the right. catalog. And in, and we're going to do a narrower frontside comparison, and you'll see some of those hero skis in that comparison for sure, and, and hopefully some of the masters too. Um, this ski is really just about, like, experience. Mm -hmm. uh, the turn radius is considerably shorter. This is a short length. I think this is a 160, yeah, 163. This is a 12-meter turn radius in this ski, so really the shortest turn radius that we've seen so far. And they're just like, they're just extremely rewarding making carving turns down groomed slopes at the resort. It's really, it's not trying to be a race ski. Like I think just the width up here right. and the shovel, it's kind of like throwing it outside of that race world and putting it squarely in this just like fun loving front side world. Um, and yeah, just an insane amount of fun I could spend 50 days this season on a Forza 70 and I would 
be perfectly happy about that. Um, I do think the 70 is somewhat, not, maybe not demanding, but like it kind of is one dimensional in what it wants to do. It wants to just carve. Yeah. Um, it does have like kind of an interesting profile, um, which is something that I think is cool to look at in comparison to experienced skis that you've got over there. So there is some tip rocker in this ski, but there's no early taper whatsoever. No. So, you know, talk about like mogul performance or anything like that. This is a really catchy shape. If you're not carving, if you're not at a high edge angle, it's it can be a little bit of a handful. The concession is the, the more flexible shovel, you know, like totally the concession yeah. with the Deacon was the was the rocker, the concession here is just a little bit more amenable of a flex. Yeah, so the construction in these skis is pretty interesting and it's really not like not trying to be World Cup construction. Mm -hmm. The one of the kind of key elements to this is they use what they're calling V tightenal. So they're they're basically like making the tightenal layer three dimensionally shaped. So they have a little V cut right down the middle of the tightenal, which is if you imagine, like if we talk about this every once in a while, like if you have just a flat sheet of thin metal, it's very floppy. Yeah. Just putting that V in it, all of a sudden you could take that same sheet of metal and like hold it out straight and right. it wouldn't just flop over. So they are kind of working some stiffness and responsiveness into that V. But yeah, it's not like, it's not a soft ski, but compared to something like a Deacon 76 Master, there's a nice suppleness to this flex. And then really like everything that we're saying about this ski pretty much carries over into the 60, but the 60 has more taper really most notably in the tip. Yeah. So it doesn't like rip you into a carving turn like the Forza 70 does. Uh, it still carves really well, but it is, it's a little bit more, definitely more approachable. And I would say it's arguably more versatile too. It has some of the experience shaping properties and the tips and the tails. Yeah, from a taper perspective. From a taper perspective. Yeah, and yeah. I would say actually even more yeah. than an experience. Is it's, it's almost like the tip looks like an old experience. Right. Or the, at least the previous generation of experience skis. But Forza 70 is super fun. 78 underfoot, so we're starting to tick a little wider here. Uh, and this came up multiple times when we were down in Boston at the Snowbound Expo, sure did. Um, which like I thought was really cool. I love when people like have found the ski that really makes sense for them. And we talked to numerous people that were like, I love the Forza yep. 70. And we were like, good, yeah, like you found, you found the ski that is best for you. I like it when the progression of like development and marketing works. Yeah. P properly yeah when Rosinal came and introduced these to us last year we were like cool like we're psyched that you guys are putting emphasis into this this wider front side category yeah and so we we're like great that's you know the development standpoint and then when we got them this year and filmed them and did a review we we're like wow these are really fun they do what Rosignal said right and then conveying that to a skier, a customer. Yep. And, and then coming like, full circle to hearing yep. that customer's feedback and yep. experience and pretty much aligned perfectly with what Rosinal said in the first place. Yeah, it's nice when these things happen the way they're supposed to. Yeah, which isn't always the case. Right. Like, we bring it, we've brought it up multiple times, say with like Vocal Blades or Blizzard Hustles or something where like what they describe on paper isn't yeah. exactly reflective of what people end up using those products for but they pretty much nailed it here you're going to use a forza 70 for achieving 70 degree edge angles yep. or higher higher what was the record so i don't know did i have the record or did you have the record i don't remember uh, this is a ski that inspired us to get the carve someone was over thing. 80. maybe we both were over 80. Like the, i want to say i got 86. it was almost easier on like a kendo than because it's a wider platform, it's a wider and you, platform. Can just, you can truly get to 90. Yeah. Yeah. And another side note on that Forza, uh, I enjoyed it a lot more in the 173 than the 181. I found the 181 to be a little bit long for that intended cut. So yeah. it worked well for me in a shorter length. It's less of like a skier size thing and more of just like the, the purpose of the ski. Yeah. 
Yeah. But like you probably like it in the 173 too. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I always think that's really interesting when you and I land on the same length. Yeah. Like it, it, I feel like that's usually pretty reflective of this ski is best in, the, in this length for yeah. most people. I could definitely see going shorter. Yeah, and we had to go shorter with the, the 60. Yeah. Uh, they didn't have the longer lengths available. So I think I skied the 60 in a 171. Yeah, that's Didn't have right. the same experience as sure. on the 173 and the 70. Sure. And this is another one where it tops out at 177. This is a head super shapey rally. You know, the intent is to be making these mid radius carved turns uh, planted in the snow. This one's pretty planted. Um, yeah, we both picked up a pair of these last year, mainly to do a protector binding uh, comparison, review, first look. I don't know what you want to call it. Comparison. But, yeah. Back to back with a PRD. Yep. So we had one ski with a protector, one ski with a PRD 12, uh, noticing any performance differences. And kind of like what we talked about with the Atomic, uh, that increase in the binding platform area and weight does make skis like this feel a little bit more at home in a carved turn. Yeah. Um, so before we kind of get into that, we'll stick to the ski. Uh, another one that's 78 underfoot, uh, similar to that Forza. So we're getting into that wider carving format. And the reason why this is on this side of the wall uh, for the Forza and the 78s is because this one adheres more to that World Cup sandwich construction. So nice tight stringers glued together, two sheets of metal, uh, and then we got graphene in this ski as well to stiffen it even further. So much more of a traditional build, whereas that Forza has kind of that uh, modern high-end recreational style. This is a lot more descendant of their race skis. Uh, and that's what gives it its power, smoothness, and control. Uh, we also get their energy management circuits in the top and bottom of the ski. Always interesting talking about like technology within these skis. Like it's supposed to filter out unwanted vibrations with circuitry. I can't say that it does or it doesn't. I believe it's even supposed to harness unwanted vibrations and transfer them into usable kinetic energy. Yeah. I, like, do I think it does that? Like, I think it does it in Formula One cars. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's where this technology comes from. Like in like more of a regenerative breaking into Correct. other energy. Yeah. yeah. I don't know that I'm convinced <laughs> that it does anything in these skis. And it's like, it's, kind of, it's a weird thing. Yeah. Because it's easy to point a finger at that and be like, eh, what's that really doing? And whenever I do that, it makes me just like immediately like have less, like a less positive perception of the ski. But this is like one of my favorite skis. Right. So it's like this counter thing where I'm like, I actually don't care. Yeah, I don't want to talk not. about it. Yeah, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to argue about right. it. The ski Because it is, doesn't matter whether doesn't matter. it does or not because the, the ski is yep. awesome. The ski is smooth and strong and stable and nary yeah. a vibration to be had when yeah. you're up on edge. Yeah. So the resulting, whatever the result is, whether it matches the intended uh, technology or not, like, I don't care. Right. Uh, the ski is strong, stable, planted, really loves to be rolled edge to edge. You know, it's not like you're getting the most energy, even like versus that, uh, that Forza, you know, which is... Well, like I think I was going to say Thunderbird. Thunderbird yeah. feels like it's more energetic. Yep. You get a little bit more pop out of the turn. Yep. Um, whereas this thing is, is more of just that planted roll-to-roll -roll cruiser. Um, you know, I kind of equate it to the Fisher. If we had that, uh, the 86 up here, that would even take it to the next level. But even the 82 really just feels like it's just a real smooth roller uh, from edge to edge. And that's kind of where this rally comes into play as well. Um, similar to what we've seen with a lot of these other skis, there's not a whole lot to talk about in terms of rocker or taper. Uh, this is one of the most least tapered skis on the planet uh, from tip to tail. Except for this one. That's why it's yeah. one of the least. One of the least. Not the least. And then metal in the tail, sidekick goes right to the end. Very impressive. 
uh, 14 meter turn radius in this 170. Um, you know, you and I are both on the 177, yeah. which I think works really well in this construction of ski. Yeah. You know, it's it's on the heavier side, and so you don't you're not you don't need that extra length in order to make up for it. So you're getting the stability and power, and you're not having to really kind of muscle around the front of a of a much longer ski. I think I'm probably more of a 170 skier. You think this would be more your length? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had fun on the 177, and yeah. I like it. And it actually, like, considering the things I use it for, I think the 177 makes more sense for me, but I would say on paper, someone my size is generally going to be a, a 170 skier. Well, I think that that's a good point, too, is that there's a lot, there's not a huge real reason to upsize on any of these skis. Not really. This is one of those ones where if you're caught in the middle, then sizing down is probably more appropriate. Say nine times out of ten. Yeah. Yeah. But really cool ski. And just to talk about the binding just a little bit, um, we, we see it on the Fisher. I think it's in the 86s for Wingman you can get it. I'd have to check that. But um, pretty much a, a, a standard option at this point to get into this protector. We didn't turn the... Uh, didn't turn the din down, but basically the heel goes sideways. And yeah. so you're increasing that lateral release out of the heel and just makes it safer on the knee joints. Um, from a performance perspective, it's more weight and you definitely feel it coming out of the heel of the turn. So from midfoot back, you can certainly feel the difference in the planted nature of the ski, probably due to the binding, because we were back to so. back with these. Yeah. A uh, good friend of mine, local skier, good skier, was asking me about the protector and and kind of whether it was a gimmicky thing. And I was like, nope, it's actually like yeah. pretty much a premium binding, especially for this type of ski. Because yeah. it is, not only is it reducing the risk of knee injuries, it's increasing elastic travel and like overall vibration damping and all those things that we love. Right. Yeah, it seems to make good sense on... A nice wide frontside ski like this. Yeah, and like just speaking to the binding just quickly here, I think it'll be interesting over the coming years to see if they can lower that stand height a little bit because I think that's kind of the biggest limitation for this binding and, and kind of increasing its application for other skis is that stand yeah. height. Especially if we're talking about like an attack protector. Totally. Versus yeah, I need to figure out that. how to suck that thing right up into the ski. Yeah. Um, and then really making kind of a departure from the aggressive carving world into this Solomon Stance 80. Um, it's been a few years now that Bob and I have been quite fond of the narrower stance skis, the 80 and the 84. I think we talked about the 84 a lot. Yep. Um, don't talk about this 80 very much, but considering the price point that this ski hits, it is really impressive and it it is like a real ski i think it's easy for some people to look at it and see the cap construction and the tips and tails and the integrated binding and the tip protector and like their mind goes to like rental ski right. but it's a poplar wood core and it's a sheet of titanol and then it's got these windows um just carbon just carbon yep. right no basalt in here nothing nothing fancy but it's the, it's the same build as the 84. right and carbon is still like, it's not like it's fiberglass. No. Or nothing. Right. So no. there's a lot of technology in this ski still. Um, the big thing that makes this ski different, or a couple things make this ski different than what we've looked at so far. One, now we're up to 80 underfoot, which we're going to continue that trend, at least for the remainder of my side of the wall here. It's got a lighter build overall, so just holding it in my hand. It's considerably lighter than most of the skis we've looked at so far. And it's definitely the softest flex pattern we've looked at so far. And, and maybe the softest ski on this whole wall. Might have to come back to it. Yep. Um, and then the other thing that I want to point out is just the differences in its shape. So we've really talked about the lack of tip rocker or any kind of rocker in most of these skis. 
Here we're starting to see a good amount. That's a decent amount of kind of progressive tip rocker with actually a good amount of splay as well. And then we're seeing notably more tail rocker in this ski than, gosh, anything except for maybe Blaze 82. Yeah. Um, and that's really representative of what this ski is, is designed to do, where most skis on this wall, especially over here on my side, are designed to be wider precision carving skis. The Stance 80 truly is a narrow all-mountain ski. It does not hit the same level of carving performance as anything else. At least, yeah, I mean, the first seven skis yeah. that we've looked at I'd actually say that this ski carves better than a Blaze 82, so yep. it's not the worst carving ski up here on this wall, but it's not like it's not designed to be as one-dimensional in, in its focus as a carving ski. So that leaves it as a fantastic mogul ski. Sure does. It's a great little short turn on the side of the trail ski. Yep. Um, really, the only limitation it has is like deep snow. Deep snow and like endless torsional stiffness for yeah. carving. But if you're looking for an affordable, approachable, really well-rounded all-mountain ski, I, I genuinely think that Solomon is is currently the leader in this kind of this category. Like it's hard for me to think of a ski at the same price point and the same width that I like more than a Stance 80 or a Stance 84. Hey, you don't have, I mean, you don't have to think too hard about it. I don't know if it exists out there. And Blaze is different to yeah. me. Blaze yeah. feels different. And we can talk about why that is when we get there. That actually feels like like less well-rounded as an all-mountain ski. Yeah, but this, it has its own little perks. It does, and yeah. its own little niche yeah. for sure. But this, if we're tra talking about like a true like even mix of performance characteristics in this price point, like, yeah, good luck finding something better than Stance 80. One of my like least favorite things about like the ski industry is how the word intermediate is viewed as a bad word. Yeah, didn't I bring that up recently that yeah. intermediate has like negative connotations and yeah. like it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Because like what, what would you what would you say? What's the percentage of skiers that are intermediates? 90. I was going to say 80, <laughs> yeah. but it's 75 it's to 80. Yeah. Like, so it's not bad. Right. And like it is, yeah, it's disappointing that like, I mean, you see it more in ski shops than than I suppose we do interacting with people online. Like yeah. having worked in ski shops for pretty much my entire adult life, if you include being here at Ski Essentials, I would say if you were to split people that come in and say I'm intermediate versus people that come in and say I'm advanced, I bet it's like 20 to 80. Like 80% of people come in and say I'm an advanced skier because like people don't want to say intermediate. Yeah. And that person would likely be much better served on a stance 80 than a stance 90. Yeah. Which, you know, that advanced skier is going to get steered towards, or at least the stance 84. Right. I don't know. Fire, but, we've, but we've noted, we've been Tuesday. noting in these comparison videos that we've, I feel like we've been trying to include more of this intermediate range. You know, even at skis at higher quality, we had like, Head shape V10. Yeah. Um, there was another one that really st stood out to me that was a, a Kessley FX86. I mean, we got like, some good ones up here too. Yep, PX81. Sure. PX81. I think even Deacon 80. It's like pretty approachable. Redster Q7. Yep. Like, the, and those are the skis that like. I don't know. I feel like we, we could we could stand up here and talk about it as long as we want. But right. I don't think we're going to convince the masses that like intermediate's not a bad thing. Right. But damn. Yeah, I just think that there's a lot of room for skis like that Stance 80, and especially when you bring the, the budget into, into account, and you're just like, I think so too. This is what I'm getting. This is my first pair of skis, and I'm going for it. I don't care if it's your first pair of skis or your 50th pair right. of skis. It's still a good ski. Totally. We this... keep it with the 80s. Yeah, and I bet this one gets overlooked too. Probably less so. I, I talk to more people yeah. that are that are really considering this than I do considering a Stance 80. This one gets overshadowed by the Deacon 84. Deacon 84 uses the Titanol frame. Uh, this uses a fiberglass frame, a little bit narrower. 
So you're looking at, you know, again, I don't like saying lower performance as worse because for no. most people, Deacon 80 is a better option than Deacon 84, mainly because it's more accessible. And there's a lot of people out there that will never touch the ceiling of this. Yeah, like, totally. I just remember seeing Ryan Daniel skiing on this. Yep. Collegiate racer. Yep. And made it look fantastic. Yeah, he was. He had a great time yeah. too. He's like, that thing's great. Yeah. Yep. So when you're looking at a high performance skier, a high level skier, really like getting every last inch of performance out of a Deacon 80, like you know that 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 ceiling is hard to reach. Yeah. So that gives me confidence that this is a better choice for people that are hemming and hawing about this or a Deacon 84 or this and something that's a, a little bit more stiff, even, you know, to look to that new Spitfire 80 there, you know, when you're getting more business oriented. That fully brings it back to business. Yeah. I've been waiting, waiting to get there. Yeah. But, yeah. But Deacon 80 uses... More, more people should ski this than that. Probably. Yeah, there's a, and especially if you like a more energetic and more poppy feeling. That's where the fiberglass really comes into play here. You're getting that glass frame, um, 3D ridge. This still uses a lot of vocals technology, um, 3D glass, so fiberglass wrapping over the sidewall, uh, putting it in a three-dimensional format, and that's gonna stiffen it, just like we talked about with the uh, that V-shaped metal ridge. When you're putting these materials in a three-dimensional format, you're really increasing kind of the workload that 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 laminate is able to adhere to. Uh, we're also dealing with Vocal's 3D radius side cut. Uh, numbers here, 20, 12, 17 in this 162. Obviously those are gonna get longer as the, the length gets longer, but shorter, about that. okay. Shorter turn radius underfoot so you can really stay central and just smash out those slalom shaped turns or you can ride it at a lower edge angle and not lose any stability at higher speeds. I don't actually remember it going to 12. A little short for... It's shorter than I remember, but I, mean, I don't... This is a little skid. I've never skied this length either, yeah. which is, I'm sure, I've never skied the 170 either. I think I've only been on the 77. And because it's on the lighter side, it yeah. felt a little short. You know, I, I think I'd be 182 in this, whereas in Deacon 84, I'm in between almost. But love the energy out of this thing. You were mentioning binding systems and how they hold on to the ski. This one, these, this low ride technology for these bindings, basically you're getting a griffin that's mounted uh, to a rail system that's integrated into the ski. Yep. So this is about as direct of a connection as you're going to get from any of these system bindings. Yeah, I think it's really cool. Uh, and it really does make a difference. Like you were saying, there's just that little extra yeah. pickup. Yeah, you got extra leverage. Yeah, extra leverage. Um, and I think that's important for a binding that does sit a little bit closer. You were talking about the protector and yep. how to solve the stand height issue. And this is Vogel's answer to that question is, you build it into the binding, you build the binding platform into the ski, and then you kind of start from there and work your way up. So pretty cool ski. Yeah, very cool. You know, it's stiff enough. Um, I think yeah. it's a surprising stiffness. It does make it pretty poppy and I don't want to say twitchy, but... It can be twitchy. It can be twitchy. Yeah, I think um, that's fair. And, it, and their concession is that rocker and so we talked about that a little bit with uh, Deacon and we're seeing the same thing here with this long like two millimeter rocker profile starting down here but doesn't make up for a whole lot uh, and same with the tail just yeah. a tiny tiny bit but it is there to help and just kind of move things along down the hill yep and that's, that's a nice nice. nice part about this thing for sure now it's an awesome ski and it's like yeah, it is kind of a bummer that it, it gets overlooked so much. I wonder, like, how much of it is people, <clears throat> when you get up this wide, maybe don't want such a one-dimensional shape. Yeah, no, I hear that. It's just, an, yeah. it's just a question, just an idea, like, kind of similar to here. It's just, like, something that 
I think as a consumer, I would get hung up on. Yeah. Because when I get up to 80, um, personally, I want a touch of versatility more in this this world. Right. So this is the Montero AX from Stokely. Um, this has become one of my personal favorite skis on the market. Um, I own a pair, and I, I think it's awesome. It has become like my not my narrowest ski, but my narrowest ski that I ski a considerable amount. Yeah. Um, it is so much fun as a just directional all mountain ski. Basically the same exact build that we talked about back there in the AS. Um, so all the kind of Stokely qualities that you expect, but this is actually one that since we brought the scale, I would like to put it on the scale. Because considering how damp and smooth this ski is, the fact that it's just over 1,900 grams to me is pretty darn impressive. Yeah. Um, so it's not like, it's not the world's best carving ski. Like, that's important to point out here, I think. If you're looking to just like maximize carving performance, like I'd rather take Redster Q9, I'd rather take Thunderbird, Deacon Master, Forza, Rally, Spitfire. Spitfire. I would definitely, I would prefer any of those skis yeah. over Montero AX when just speaking to carving, but it does carve really well. Um, it's a flat ski, you know, so you have the, the customization option here. You can kind of take it and make it what you want it to be. And for me, putting a pivot on it, that made it like not just my front side carving ski, but my narrow all mountain ski. So not a lot of tip rocker up here, but again, it's a Stokely. You're never going to see a ton of tip rocker. Although who remembers the Storm Rider 110 TT? Uh, me? That <laughs> ski had some tip rocker. Uh, that ski was a monster too. Uh, but we do have some nice early taper yeah. in this ski. And that's like kind of speaking to like this shape and this shape. That's mostly where my mind was going is these are, are more firm snow focused. So Montero AX is, in my opinion, a great mobile ski. Um, it's maybe not as good as AR. Like I think AR kind of takes it to another level. But it's not like punishingly stiff. And I think you combine that tapered shape in the tip with just a little bit of suppleness, and that's where it gets all of its versatility. Um, I'm, I hesitate to use the word forgiveness. Like, I don't necessarily know that this is a particularly forgiving ski. Maybe not as jarring as some of the things up here, Rally, Spitfire, um, but it is versatile, like for an 80 underfoot ski. It's, it's amenable to go where you want it to go. Yeah. And that's, what's, that's what I like about that. And it, again, going from gradients from the AR to the AX, this is a lot more willing to do that. Whereas the yep. AR has its mind more made up as to what it wants to do. Yep. So like this AX for me, a lot, right in the sweet spot for shorter turns, side of the trail, you can manipulate the turn radius easier. Whereas the yep. AR, increase in width, increase in weight, increase in turn radius, wants to wants to move down the hill more yeah i also find that you can manipulate like carving yeah. turn radius in this ski because you can bend it which ultimately is why i chose to like race on it a yeah. bunch because it was easier for me to bend yeah um, so i didn't have to like break free from a carve but i could get over to a tight gate right no it's i mean they're very smooth turning skis like to the nth degree. Yeah. And certainly the quality sh shows through and how they feel on your feet. And yeah. You just don't feel a whole lot. You know, like the, the head, you don't feel a whole lot, like vibration wise, but you feel the things. Right. Whereas these are a lot more just floaty through the carve. Yep. Which is a, a very rare thing to get with such a high performance ski. Uh, by the time this video comes out, um, opening day at Stowe is the day after tomorrow, if you're watching this when on the day that the video came out. 
And I don't know that I will take them because I worry about damaging skis on the first day of the year. With oh, they'll be fine. I know. I'm, I'm very tempted to, <laughs> ski, to ski these on opening day because they're grippy, they're trustworthy, but they're not, like, punishing. Yeah. So, great ski. And quite different than this next ski. What's amazing from my view is looking at the profile of this, especially versus the Deacon 80 right there. Um, just yeah. from the, the, the height of camber uh, from this Spitfire. Yeah, I mean, we're really going back, like, kind of close to, like, Thunderbird yeah. world. Um, you know, you can, they can't see it from how I'm holding it, but you can ski the, see the amount of camber in this yeah. ski. And it is, it's just kind of more inspired by a, a race ski. Yep. Um, this is the new uh, Nordica Spitfire 80. They did some retooling of their on-piste skis. Uh, I guess that's kind of a cautious way to say it. They completely overhauled the, the constructions and yeah. most and of, the, the width. of the widths of the their width. yeah. front side skis. Because in Spitfire we were 72, 76, 80, and now we're 74, 80. Yep. And we've broken Spitfire and Doberman apart yep. uh, from a construction perspective. Um, all of them, including the Steadfast 85 that we've reviewed earlier this season, uh, use a double core technology. So they're using horizontal wood laminates rather than vertical stringers. And they're putting uh, metal laminate and a pulse core layer in here as well. Um, the difference, Spitfire is using the single metal laminate when we get into the Doberman and that really cool multi-gara multi yeah. that I hope we have for our narrow front side comparison. It, it was in this building. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Um, they're using the double metal laminates to go along with the double core. So No lack of stiffness here, though. It's amazing what they get. And, you know, we kind of found that to be true about Steadfast 85. Um, you know, the concession is is the more bulbous shape with the steadfast, the more rounded shape, and that's bringing yeah. it into the more recreational and more versatile side of the spectrum. Yeah, not far off in width nor construction, but pretty far off in feel. Totally, and the that height of camber and then this lack of taper in both tips and tails really accentuate the race background. You know, Nordic yeah. is using their race shaping to get the performance out of this DC-80. Well, a race binding, too. I mean, the same binding yep. system that we're getting over here in, in Thunderbird. Right. But here's that. It'll probably squish a little bit because of the, because of the binding, but if I hold mm. it up just a little bit to offset, like there's a lot of positive camber going on in this ski. No rocker. Fully, fully camber, tip to tail. Super smooth. You know, again, similar to Head, where they're using their energy management circuit as this ploy to convince us that the skis are smooth because of that reason. This double core is Nordica's way of doing that, and it works. You know, it just makes the skis feel smoother and more stable and more amenable to carving pretty hard round turns. We spent more time on the 74 this year than the 80. Yep. Um, I've skied the older Spitfire 80 quite a bit in the past, and it's amazing how that felt more like a wide race ski, whereas this has a little bit more of that high-end recreation notes versus true race, but there's still that race borrowed from it. I think that they're separating, you know, Doberman from Spitfire with intent, um, but... No love lost in terms of performance from this thing. Incredibly energetic and precise and just so much fun to ski. It's one of the more rewarding carving skis out there because it's wide. You know, I think that the width of this thing is kind of the biggest appeal where you have a wider platform underfoot and that's going to support deeper carves, higher edge angles. Yeah. And when you put it in a build like this, it really just makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it doesn't get bogged down no. as easily. No, this thing plows through stuff. And, you know, from kind of a reality standpoint, it's pretty rare that you're dealing with perfectly smooth groomers and corduroy all day. Right. Whereas, sure, 68, 70, 75, 
yeah. better for that just rock hard, smooth and surface. I, I would draw the, the cutoff right before Forza. Yeah. Where and even like Rally, Rally prefers a a more perfect yeah. skiing surface, but especially things over here that are now kind of directly behind me. Yeah. Like yeah, those things get a little unnerving when the snow is imperfect. Whether it's like a softer packed powder day or Just as the day. snow goes yeah. throughout the day. Yeah. That's where having these wider waist widths is super helpful. Yeah. Um, you know, because we do get a lot of really nice packed powder groomer days here. Yep. You know, it's not always boilerplate, does happen, but there are a lot of really nice packed powder days. And when you get on something too narrow, uh, someone like me, I'm going to push right through the right. snow. Right. Whereas this just gives more surface area to stand on and just a more confident car from tip to tail. Yeah. So I really like these wider race styled skis. I think they make a lot of sense. Um, especially if you are using them in an area where you do get softer pack powder or you do see conditions degrade throughout the day. You know, it's not accentuating the off-trail performance. You know, there's not a lot of versatility, but the confidence and comfort that you get throughout the day, I think, warrants that wider waist. That is a crazy amount of camber when you look at it leaning against the wall. Yeah, that vocal is very much yeah. in that flatter style. Yep. And this Nordica is just bowed out. So a lot of energy built into the ski through the camber. Yeah, and stiff too. Yep. So a lot of camber and stiff flex. So totally. You got a lot to push against. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> next ski is, again, like similar to progression from Rally to Stance 80. I feel like the progression from Spitfire 80 to Kessley PX81 is kind of similar. Yep. So this ski at least follows that <clears throat> that all mountain focus like the Stance 80 more than a lot of these skis that focus purely on carving performance. So just a wood core in this ski, it's a mixture of poplar and beech. There's no metal, there's no carbon additives, there's no torsional torsion control right. systems, there's no energy management circus. We do get hollow tech cuz I don't think it would qualify as a Kessley if you didn't get hollow tech, but the PX81 is a pretty straightforward, no frills, all mountain ski. Um, and I think because of that, and because of what most people look for when they shop for a Kessley, is not many people ski it. It's one of those skis that's like consistently disappointing for us, not from its performance, but from the amount of people that benefit from its performance. Like, have you ever seen one in the wild? No, I don't, I don't think, think so. I've ever seen one out there. No, and we like we've had them outside of our office, just yep. kind of staring at us for at least a couple of years now. So we're constantly reminded of this ski, and then no one buys it, which is, again, just disappointing. So. What I like about the PX81 is you're benefiting from the Kessley quality of manufacturing and like Kessley precision and, and just a high-end feel, but it's completely different than the MX line in the sense that it's, it's actually pretty darn approachable and like easy to ski. Yeah. So I just think that's awesome. It also hits a much more affordable price point than any Kessley MX ski. Um, and it's not like it's a noodle, you know, there's a right. lot more ski here than something like the Stance 80. Obviously, we're in different price points from Stance 80 to PX81, but there's a lot to like here. And it's kind of one of those things where talking about the split of like intermediates to advanced or expert skiers, like the split of people that would benefit more from a PX than they would from an MX, MX-88 is, is huge. Yeah. And you see a lot more MX-88s out there. So pretty s supportive flex pattern, but not demanding whatsoever. The shovel is, you know, quite, quite easy to manipulate, which I think is great, whether yep. you're like entering a carving turn and bending it into more of a shorter arc or a shorter shorter carving turn or if you're stuffing it into a mogul like there's a lot yeah. that this ski can do really really well and it's still like a lot of ski overall you know i'll take that one from you in a moment here bob but you still get like a lot of strength out of the tail 
So it's kind of like really good for a pretty technical skier, somebody with good technique that they still want all that feedback out of their ski, but they don't want something that's like too stiff, too demanding, and, and just too tiring. So not much tip rocker up here, but it is more of a progressive tip shape than a lot of the carving skis or a lot of the skis in this range that we've seen. And then, yeah, like, like I was just describing, it's a pretty darn flat tail. So it's yeah. not like a Stance 80, it's not like a Blaze 82, where it's just kind of like wash out and be super, super forgiving. So it's approachable, it's easier to ski than a lot of things up here, but it's still, to me, it's still a high-end ski. And, you know, off the charts versatility compared to a Spitfire 80. Yeah, I'll bring moguls into this conversation for sure. Anytime yeah, you're great seeing mogul ski. This, this tip flex come into it, it's just a lot more... It's a lot easier to get the thing to go where you want it to go, whereas if you point the tips of your Spitfire into, you know, a mogul that's anywhere firmer than powder, it's just gonna it's gonna want to start a carve. Yeah. And that's what the that's what that ski is meant to do. Whereas this one, like you were kind of saying, doesn't just have that that fore aft flex, but also just allows a little bit more of that torsional flex. Yeah. So it's gonna be able to absorb unwanted issues and just kind of not be as punishing it's not gonna you know make you pay for your mistakes it's a little bit more friendly and forgiving and something that like i would like to spend more time on like this totally. thing seems right up my alley in terms of all mountain performance especially here in vermont where that's kind of why i meant what i meant by like it's a, a technical ski yeah. like i feel like you're a very technical skier where you would you know like i could honestly see you skiing that every day. Yep. And being perfectly happy. Well, maybe we'll do it. Yeah, why not? Matches my boots, too. You know, it's actually quite similar to Experience 86 or 82 Basalt. Yeah, no, like I think you're standing right. Standing over here and like looking at those skis side to side by side, it's like something that I don't know that I've ever really like profoundly had that thought before, yeah. but looking at them here, pretty similar both like very approachable but still very like technical skis with like really precise feedback well it's just another another kind of nod to this high-end intermediate ski yeah this high quality product right. that's meant for this mid-range of skiers right which is great to have yeah um and you know this one this blaze 82 fits into that category but in a different way yeah, um, I think so. Let's start with this one on the scale, if you want to do that for me, because that's certainly the overarching theme with the Blaze skis, is that they are light and incredibly mobile and agile, and that's what's going to give this thing a different level of performance, you know, from on-trail carving to off-trail bumps and trees. Uh, under 1,500 grams, certainly the lighter... I would say this is very, very light for. It's got to be the lightest wall. ski on this wall yeah. by a good like 400 grams. Um, we were introduced to this last fall uh, as the narrower of the Blaze options. We've been seeing Blaze kind of go both ways from the 94 and the 106. You know, now this is bookending um, the one, I'm sorry, 114 on the wider side so 82 to 114 it's a huge range pretty cool of skis in revolt, this blaze lineup revolts the same thing it's yeah. like 84 to 121 yeah yeah vocals hilarious <laughs> they just have so many skis and they're able to just easily expand on a on a given line yep um this follows the 86 build so no metal underfoot still get suspension tips and tails uh and just this super light multi-layer wood core in here um, you skied this this year, and I was really impressed with how well this thing stood up to your aggressive high-speed skiing. Yeah. I was impressed. I, I don't thought, think I was skiing that fast. It, but it seemed fast for the ski, knowing did. what was on your feet. So, uh, yeah, I, and I agree 100%. It did more than I initially gave it credit for. Yeah. Like, it, I... I was like not psyched, right, going out on that day, um, and yeah, it surpassed. It certainly surpassed my expectations, and it's like, it's so different than anything else in its category. 
Because it's like it yeah. takes like a narrow intermediate ski and turns it into like a free ride ski. Like the edge release is off the chair. Like it's just like you can do things on it that you can't do on a lot of these skis. Right. Like stance 80 flat. That's is, the closest. Is the closest comparison. you're going to get. Yeah. Maybe experience 82 flat. I don't know though because the but, tail's so much different. Yeah. But at any rate, incredibly quick. Yeah. Just super easy to move. Um, Emily skied this thing too. I think we have some mogul footage of her, um, you know, skiing on a pretty soft day. You know, I would say yeah. six or seven inches of snow up there. And you're not expecting an 82 to really be the, the tool you're looking for for a day like that. Um, but Emily's a great combination of, of lightweight and, and strong legs. Yep. And she was just able to rip these things. This and the 86, you know, kind of through the deeper snow and through the bumps. Very impressive to see that high level of skiing uh, kind of go down on something like this, which is, again, yeah. like throwing that bad word intermediate around. I was like, just going to say, is that, like, could there possibly be a better visual representation of what we're right. trying to say about intermediate skis? Yeah. Like, is that intermediate skiing? Right. No. So, like, it's not the ski's fault. Right. Like, <laughs> no. the ski, if anything, could be a benefit for you. Yeah. And you can still do really high-end things on, on an intermediate level ski. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of upside to this. We're seeing that free ride influence. Yeah. Funny to see how a race influence... Totally. Hits an 80 right there. Two millimeters apart. Yep. And then the free ride influence hits this 82. So dialing down the amount of rocker and taper into these narrower categories, but, you know, pretty flat when we hold it up side by side. Yeah. And then, again, that long, low vocal rocker profile, a little bit more splay at the end. Uh, and then, you know, let's just bring touring into the conversation for a minute. Like... This, these Blaze skis, like you were talking about earlier, the intent originally was that Blaze was a hybrid or touring version of a ski. We've always kind of noted with those hybrid skis that the, na the narrower you go, the more of a touring emphasis there can possibly be. And certainly when we're looking at a sub 1500 gram ski, uh, uphill efficiency is going to be very good. Yep. So it's hard not to bring that up. I don't know if this is really the, the clientele that's going to be watching this video to say, I want a front side ski that also tours, and here I am. Yeah, and yeah. But I feel like even like when Vocal was first telling us about that ski, they talked about touring more than they do now. Yeah. Because I don't think like there are other options like for that narrow, narrow ski touring skier. Right. Like, you got like random day race skis in that category. And they're much lighter than that. Much lighter than that. Yeah. Right. So if you're like, if you don't need the width, I think it's hard for like a true touring enthusiast to land on that. And then if you're not a true touring enthusiast, then like what are the odds that you actually put a touring gliding on there? Right. Pretty small. I was really waiting for you to say like this is the only ski up here that you could even go touring on, and I was gonna raise my hand and say, <laughs> I own a pair of Alpine trekkers. I will go toward any of them. <laughs> any of <these>. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's just really nice to see this filter down into narrower models. And uh, personally, I, if given the choice, I'm leaning towards narrower skis. Uh, fits my style more. So it's not in my mind. It's great to see these skis kind of get pared down in terms of width. You know, what's also cool about Blaze is how important it's become for vocal. Totally. It is like, it, it truly is a undeniably an important category of skis for them, where vocal historically, you know, you think mantras and kendos and deacons yeah. and masters and stuff like that. But those blazes are, are great and they, they did a really good job designing them. Totally. Yep. Um, next ski up here, been around for a while. You get a graphics update for this upcoming season. Um, I don't think we've got any footage on the new graphic because we had some camera or SD card issues from our Rossignol Media Day, which I don't think I've ever cited before, but sorry, Rossignol. 
Uh, the tech, tech Better luck next year. Yeah, was it, you, can, you know, every once in a while, if it's like one out of 50 days that we yeah. have a corrupted SD card, I'd say that's a pretty good yeah, success all right. rate. Um, but this is the Experience 82 Basalt. So, you know, I'm going to go out and say it, Bob. I'll say the same thing about Alon. You guys don't need this many skis in this width range. There, I said it. All right. So I think there's a lot of experienced skiers. We're going to see the same thing in Wingman, and you actually see the same exact width. So there's 282s and yep. 280s. Sorry, Wingman, there's 386s. But here with Rosignal, you get 282s and 286s. Um, and it is nice. Like, I appreciate the differences among all those skiers. I just think it's very hard for skiers to land on which one is best for them. So. Experience 82 Basalt here, I think the skier that this is best for is very similar to the skier that we were describing to start this comparison over in Redster Q7. <coughs> Excuse me, but you should want a wider ski. So right. not that you're necessarily getting soft snow performance out of this ski. In fact, I would say that Blaze 82 and, and Stance 80 have far better soft snow or off-piece performance. But it can handle that late day chop, you know, yep. things that we were kind of using to describe the Spitfire and why you would go 80. It's just nice. If you want a front side focused, carving focused ski, but you encounter variable conditions, say more often than you don't, then I think moving up to this, this width is really nice. Polonia wood core, and then it's like really benefiting from basalt rather than Titanol, which we'll see Titanol in the Experience 82 Ti. Between Polonia and Basalt, this ski feels very light and it feels very, very responsive. And it does so in like <clears throat> kind of an interesting way where I've found that like, it's not that you can over flex it, but if you're more of an advanced skier who's really driving the ski, you can like, it's not even really overpower it, but if you start to give it too much, then it like it reacts too quickly. And then it kind of turns into like a little bit of a twitchy, unnerving skiing experience. But again, if you're like sticking to moderate speed, similarly to how we were describing that Redster Q7, then what I'm finding as a, a deterrent of ski ability turns into a benefit. So for that less aggressive skier, for that more moderate speed skier, having a ski that's light and very reactive like this is really nice because you just don't have to give it as much skier input to get the same kind of rewarding experience out of it. So I've skied it quite a bit. And as long as you kind of like dial it back and yeah. just go and like cruise, it's a lot of fun. And, and just like, yeah, it's like a high end premium skiing experience. You just can't push it that hard. Um, and then, you know, we talked about kind of some of that soft snow performance or off-piece performance. I do think they, they do a good job with this tip shape. That's partly where you're getting a lot of the, the variety and turn shapes and kind of being able to manipulate the ski into different things. I don't think you're getting a ton of soft snow performance out of this ski. And part of that is is this tail. So there's not much tail rocker back here and it is pretty like flat and yeah, not like completely squared off, but it, it is pretty much extended side cut back there. Um, and like I was saying, I think it's really cool to kind of see the influence from experience shaping concepts into Forza shaping concepts. And obviously experience 82 basalt and Forza 70 are two very different things, but you can when you're looking at them next to each other, you can see at least like the shared technology yeah. between them and the shared concepts. So I don't know that there's a huge group of skiers who are going to be choosing this ski. I, part, part of that's going back to that intermediate yep. term and like not really wanting to land on an intermediate ski, but I think there's a lot to like here. Totally. And there's a lot of people that will write in and ask questions about skis. And they'll, they'll might be asking about a Brahma 82 or something like sure. that. And they're, 
they're intermediate skiers. They spend most of their time on groomed terrain. And marketing kind of takes them to the high end. But kind of the better way to look at it is you should be steering to this because this is the type of ski that does most of the work for you. Yeah. And that's a huge benefit for a lot of skiers. Yeah, if you're skiing like 10 days a year right. or less, like, why would you ever want more? You're an on-trail skier. Yeah. You're not looking to be overly aggressive. Right. You want something that has, I mean, whether you know it or not, the camber is the reactive property of the ski that gets you from turn to turn. Right. So you're looking for that type of feeling in the ski, and that's where something like this comes along, and even opposed to its TI counterpart. Much different up there. So much different. Yeah. Incredibly different skis. Um, you know, just that one does a lot of it for you, whereas skis more towards this end in the 82s, you're going to have to do more of the work. Yeah, it's like, I, I think of this ski, and I like everything that you just said, but like, your goals for skiing have little to do with skiing. Right. Does that make sense? Like, your goals with going skiing are more about, like, having a good day. Right. Like, having a fun, positive skiing experience with your friends or family. Yep. And, like, Experience 82 Ti, with that ski, your, your goals are more focused on the actual skiing. Yeah. Like, I'm going to improve my edge angles. I'm going to get better at pushing through the end of a high-speed GS turn. Yeah, no, I agree. This, and that's what, and that's kind of like recreational skiing. And what percentage of people out there, you can do it. Can I? Yes. I can. <laughs> you know, what percentage of people are recreational skiers you know yeah, it's like at least half i don't want to lump intermediates and recreational skiers into the no exact i think those are two different they're, they're two different things yeah but there's a lot of both of them yeah and there's a lot of crossover between those two categories too yeah and yeah if you're a recreational skier again going back to why why would you want more ski than right. that and again it's like a hard thing to perceive like skis are so weird compared to right. totally. everything else yep. like I use the mountain bike analogy a lot as like a, a contrast to skiing where like if you're an intermediate mountain biker and you go spend ten thousand dollars on a mountain bike you're going to be a better mountain biker than if you spend four thousand dollars on a mountain bike yeah yeah if you're an intermediate skier and you go out and spend fifteen hundred dollars on your skis you're going to be a worse skier right. that that's more likely to happen than being a better skier right. and like you know we, you've you've mentioned this a couple times in this video like we are starting to see some manufacturers produce high-end intermediate skis like that price tag yeah but in a ski that will benefit your skiing performance and your skiing experience um, but there's still there aren't many of them at all no and that's kind of like this this threesome right here I it's think is, is good representative of that. Yeah. Um, and I also like how these two skis have the exact same binding on them, which is great. Well, who would have guessed <laughs> that the sister companies that yeah. share the same binding would use the same binding? Uh, this is a new model from Dina Star M Cross 82. We have skied the 88, done a full review on that. That also made it into our 90 millimeter comparison video. So same things apply to this ski, just in that narrower format. And I'd say like a bunch of hints were kind of taken from Forza in terms of our more pintailed shape with that wider shovel yeah. and then kind of relatively narrower tail. It's like a forgiving Forza. Yeah, much more maneuverable, easy to kind of get from turn to turn certainly bringing some all-mountain versatility into this ski. Uh, they're using their hybrid core. So I think the build is what brings uh, M-Cross over from experience here uh, by I using that, so too. Yeah, that polyurethane material. Hacked. It's just smoother. Yeah. 
Um, and then the wood core we talked about with M-Cross, where they're using like joinery with these horizontal metal or wood laminates, excuse me. Do you know how heavy or how stiff this thing is? Pretty stiff. Yeah, good stiffness, good energy out of this yeah. ski. Um, basically using joined horizontal wood laminates as opposed to uh, sandwiched stringers. So different way of building, a little bit more eco-friendly because it uses less adhesive. Uh, and then just having that, that wood core held together by friction, you're actually, seems like you're getting more energy out of it. I don't know. Uh, again, one of those things that is pointed to I don't know if it works the way it's supposed to, but mixing the polyurethane, uh, three different wood applications in here, uh, and then this H-Tech underfoot. So getting this, you know, these arms out with that additional material here really helps keep the forebody and the tail firmly planted on the snow. But we are seeing a little bit more of that free ride influence come in with this, uh, with this tape, tip shape. So more taper, a little bit better in softer snow. This is where we start to see some versatility come in. You know, my, my grandmother used to wrap all of her Christmas presents without tape. Just this, by This is friction. my uh, joinery, yep. uh, lack of epoxy analogy. Fold, like fancy folding. Yeah. It's impressive. Yeah. I'm all tape. Not, a, just wrap everything not like tape. a relevant or not a, a yeah. useful analogy, but... Uh, uh, at least a fun memory for me, and, and when you were talking about joinery techniques yeah. and, and the resulting in, or lack, less epoxy, um, I think that's really interesting, yeah. and I, I actually, like, I hope we see more and more of that in ski construction. It seems like it's starting to become a thing. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of thinking through different solutions to the same manufacturing challenges. Yeah. Uh, 14 meter turn radius, so shorter. And that's kind of the point of M-Cross, is you're, they're bringing this carving into the all-mountain format. And we kind of talked about in, in the other video with the 88 that this is, or the 88 at least, is more of a directional version of a Black Crow's Mirror's core. Yeah. So really fun, playful carving ski, just more directional. So that's where my mind goes with this, is kind of these more dramatic shapes and what effect do they create? They create this really just, uh, you know, fun-loving carved turn. And that's where this thing is, is great. <coughs> Excuse me. So I, um, not to cut you off, but I, I, can't, I can't get over the, uh, the off-piste potential, too, of this shape. Certainly. And that's one of the things that was fun about the 88, too, is that this tip, Good amount of rocker, very kind of M Pro ish in yeah. terms of that rocker, but they do it in basically the opposite way. So M Pro, uh, narrower overall, less kind of dramatic taper. This wider overall with more dramatic taper. Yeah. So they're kind of a kind of opposing their M Pro series of skis with M Cross, and yeah, that certainly allows even the shorter arc of a ski to just kind of plane up and stay over uh, fresh and soft snow. Yeah, I also, it, like, it might just be perception, but it feels like the tail comes around really easily because of like the difference between tip and tail width. Yep. Um, like we don't talk about taper in that reference very often, but right. when you have a, a significantly wider tip than tail, it does make the back end of the ski feel a little bit more agile. So yeah, I think it's, you know, it's right there with Stance 80, uh, with PX81, with Blaze 82 that's hiding from me as, as, in my opinion, one of the better off-trail skis on this whole wall. Yeah, and more of like an autopilot style, whereas we've yeah. talked about M-Pro is like the opposite. So yeah. cool yeah. to see that Dina Star kind of bucks the trend of having multiple 82s that are have the same footprint. They're kind of going the other way and opposing their footprints. Yep. So I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah. I didn't like really mean to like give Rosingo and Alana a hard time necessarily. I just think there's a lot of skis in this in this width range. I mean, if if your goal is to make it easier for your customer base to land on a ski, it is more challenging if you have. Yeah, it's a tough it's a tough thing, isn't yeah. it? Because if you have more options, then like 
arguably there is a more appropriate ski for your the the uniqueness of you as a skier and like the 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 independent things that you want in a ski yeah but it also makes it ch more challenging to find the right ski because you're sifting through more skis so it's like the it's like it's a positive and a negative yeah. at the same time but for from a reality perspective is this skier going to be so much worse off on this CTI and vice versa like they're I think they're these are close. so close that it's hard to it's these hard are, to make the debt differentiation they're closer than the the experience 100% where an experienced 82 TI skier would like somebody who really should be on that one would be I think pretty disappointed with the 82 basalt and vice versa yeah. 82 basalt skier would be wildly overpowered by an 82 ti yeah. or just wouldn't be wouldn't benefit from it this there are differences between wingman 82 ti and wingman 82 cti but i think it's harder to land on those differences for sure so this ski we don't get the carbon rods that's like pretty much the only difference between this ski and the CTI is it's a different wood core. It's not that tube light wood core. And then we're really just getting metal laminates. But 82 underfoot with this shape that we'll look at in just a second with a full vertical sidewall and metal. Like yeah. what the what does that add up to? Yeah, I mean it's high performance in a wide bodied ski, especially with this the sharpness of and low profile of the shape. Exactly. So like I, th I just feel like the wingman line is, is tricky because they're all pretty high-end skis. Yeah. Um, and if anything, like, it's hard to stand here and say that the CTI is better. It's more just what you want your ski to feel like. So this ski, without carbon, focuses more on just vibration damping. So this, yep. this ski is, like, really glued to the snow surface um, where... When you move to CTI, and, and I guess when we get to CTI, we can just breeze right through it. Or I don't just want to weigh them. Sure, you weigh them right now, yeah. I, I don't think it's going to be tremendously different. I don't think so either. Um, so, yeah, Wingman 82 Ti, you're going to save a little bit of money over a CTI, and you don't get as much, like, reactivity or spring out of the carbon. This is 100. 200 grams heavier. Yeah. Hundred of that is in the binding. No, oh, they are different. Apologies. I bet a hundred of it is in the binding. Yeah, at least. So, anyways, you're saving a little a little bit of money here. Yeah. And you're still getting a really high end ski. I think all of the wingman skis, um, they all lean more towards carving than all mountain but they are less focused on carving uh, than just about anything over here. Maybe take out stance 80. So you are getting a little bit of all-mountain versatility out of these skis. They just kind of make it rounder. Like a lot of elements to its shape are very yeah. rounded. And that's where, sure, it takes away a little bit of precision, but I think you you gain some forgiveness and, and you gain some versatility for softer snow. Very RC1-esque tail shape there, yep. which I think is important. Like it's still kind of, you know, it comes to a flat squared off finish, but the way that they just round it a little bit, it does kind of increase its forgiveness and versatility. Totally. But I think they're great skis. They're also like, you know, we talk about amphibio profile and the left and right ski concept. I feel like we talk about it more with ripsticks, but you could argue that it's it's just as beneficial, if not more beneficial, in wingman because you're spending so much time linking, carving turns, and the way that they build these skis, both from an asymmetrical shaping perspective and from an asymmetrical construction perspective, it just shoots the intuitiveness through the roof. Where some of these skis really, you got to work work pretty hard, work pretty hard. Yeah. You don't, there's like no uh, I have to work pretty hard on the Wingman 86 Black Edition. Yeah, but I mean, they're all still, the others, they're still stiff. You I don't know, feel they're... like there's a ton of 
no work that you just required. you feel it in the uphill ski how it just it go yeah. tracks right along yeah you know you don't have to tip in as much on that uphill uphill foot yeah no I like whenever I get on a wingman I'm like oh this is how Ted Liggety feels like right. all the time like my inside foot's doing like the correct thing and I'm creating these cool angles and and really the ski is, is helping with that a ton well we'll take a brief break I didn't want to put them together just That's fine. It's no. just, I'm going to talk about this Wingman 82 CTI for about 26 no, seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll move on. Um, couldn't really think of a good ski to put in there, so chose this one. I think that fits nicely in between those two skis. If Even we're going does, in a progression yeah. of like forgiving and approachable to stiff and, and demanding, then yeah. It just does very different things. It is a very a, different ski. Would you agree that like if Wingman as a collection leans towards carving, declivity leans more all mountain? Yeah, and for the same reasons that Blaze does as well. Um, declivity 82 Ti is the narrowest of that free ride division of skis. What right. do we go up to? A 116? Declivity that, X? Yeah. I think it might be 115. But okay, yeah, you're you're right there. But again, very big range of widths within declivity series. Um, these are interesting. They use the lightweight Karuba wood core um, with that metal laminate, and so you're kind of combining opposing elements of light wood and then heavier metal, but still keeps this thing pretty light and reactive. And I don't know if anyone's ever gotten on a declivity of any width and had a bad time. I don't think it's possible. 1,700 grams, you know, with the, the same kind of passion that we talk about, like Solomon being like a solid and smooth ski, uh, Declivity has that same type of feel going on. So it's really, really rewarding and quiet um, with a ton of all-mountain potential. So this certainly falls on the side of narrow all-mountain ski versus wide front side carving ski. Yeah, even wingman. You know, yeah. even though there's not a big range in width there, I think just the collection is yeah. wide wide carving ski, wide front side ski. And that's a really important distinction to make when you're kind of in this process of selecting a ski in this width range because yeah. this wall contains a lot of bridge skis that really blur that line between front side and all mountain. Yeah. And interestingly, like there's the wider wingmans, there's the wider fishers, there's the wider experiences that are still kind of blurring that line between front side and all mountain. So like a wingman 86 even was more of a front side ski I than agree. a declivity 82. I agree. So there's just some considerations to be made and a lot of that has to do with just the shape of the ski. So flat, put your binding of choice on here. I'm continually impressed with how much camber is in these declivity skis. Like, that's that's a lot of camber. Yeah. And when they're when they're decambered, it's not a ton of rocker. Camber's coming back. Yeah. And so again, you're getting that energy built in with the camber. Add a metal laminate to that, and you're getting nice dampness, nice power, great energy out of it. Little bit of tail rocker here, not a whole lot. Typical kind of bulge at the end of the declivity skis. We see that through 88C, 92TI, 102TI, where you're getting a nice kick out of the end of the turn here. 15.9 uh, meters here in the 174. And right up there with the best of them in terms of moguls and off-trail performance. Yeah. Um, we had the 88C up here recently. That thing's a little stiffer than this which is pretty impressive. Yeah, metal doesn't make a ski stiff. Yeah, so really does a nice job of keeping things smooth and quiet. Uh, and I would probably rather ski this in the moguls than anything else up here. So that's, that's fun, because I wouldn't. Um, I think I'd rather ski like, I think I'd rather ski a Blaze 82 and this in the moguls and maybe a Montero AX for different reasons. Yeah. But that just when you throw the metal in that ski, 
um, I don't know that I would have as easy of a time on it in the moguls as you would. Yeah, it doesn't bother me a whole lot, especially when there's when it's this narrow. Right. Um, I think that really brings the ski to life. So this is your narrow all-mountain ski. This is someone I think that prioritizes general skiing over carving. Yeah. You still want the ski to carve, but you're more looking for something that's has a versatile nature. Yeah, I agree. Whereas when you're looking at either wingman, yep. your priority is carving first. Yep. And if you can eke out some off-trail capabilities, so much the better. But this one, certainly more focused on off-trail or all mountain performance. You know, there is more off-trail capabilities than a lot of other skis on this wall, but that doesn't mean that it's better than 88C or any other declivity series skis out there, but, or Blaze 82 for that fact. Yep. Uh, but definitely more of that all mountain style. But so much fun. Again, no one skis a declivity and doesn't like it. I, I, I can't, certainly can't remember it ever happening. Same is true on the Reliance side. It just seems like yeah. they, they have extremely broad appeal. And like, and I've, I've seen such a huge range in ability <clears throat> levels ski the Declivity 82 Ti, yeah. and everyone seems to enjoy it. All right, 26 seconds, you're on the clock. I know, I regret saying that, um, mostly because I was thinking about the timestamps of the video and oh. how, sh how short the yeah. Wingman 82 CTI section would look, and then I thought about like somebody like Ben Fresco being like... Only 26 seconds? The hell, man. Like, <laughs> thought you liked their ski and I'd be like I do like your skis I'm so sorry it didn't work anyways yeah. so I'm gonna spend a little bit longer than 26 seconds but we kind of already covered it with the uh, wingman 82 ti this CTI version we get the tube light wood core and we get carbon rods that's really the, the big thing here um, with those carbon rods Typically when we're talking about them, we're talking about how good they are with vibration damping because in ripsticks, like the skis are light and soft flexing, but they still have good vibration damping. So we kind of talk about it as like a light alternative to metal for vibration damping. When you're in the wingman skis, I've always found that the feel, sure they're doing the same thing, but the perceived feel is different because it's going up against the TI versions. So when you ski a Wingman TI back to back with a Wingman CTI, instead of increased vibration damping in these skis, I feel vi or increased energy. Right. So that carbon just acts as more of like a spring. And you know, I think you can feel it in the flex pattern. Yep. Like it is more of a, a springy responsive flex pattern out of this ski rather than more of the damp kind of like that Wingman 82 Ti, it's not soft, but it feels like you can just keep pushing and pushing and pushing without the ski springing back as much. Yeah, it just doesn't have it. Yeah, so mostly a skiing style thing. Like, I think there are people out there that will prefer the more damp, smoother, quieter feel of the Wingman 82 Ti. And then I definitely think there are skiers that would prefer just the responsiveness and kind of like eagerness to exit a turn that this ski has. Um, I, for one, prefer the CTI skis over the TI skis. I think like having a little bit of extra energy in the ski helps me being a lighter skier. Like I think the ski just responds to the input that I can provide it a little bit better. Um, 82 CTI and 86 CTI, I actually find it a hard, hard to differentiate between those, those two. yeah. Because they're so close in width and just construction and overall feel that it's like I would have a hard time choosing between the two, which is kind of going back to what I said before experience. Like, I just think maybe they've got like one, one too many skis in the experience and wingman collection, but... It's a different I also, discussion. Like, it's I also fine. don't necessarily want people to make fewer skis. Like, right. I really like skis and I like talking about them. Yep. So it's kind of fun having five wingman skis all within four millimeters of each other. Um, but yeah, I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head talking about this being a wider carving ski, less of a narrow all mountain ski, 
more of a wider carving ski, but not quite as focused as, say, Spitfire as being a wide carving ski. There is a, a touch of versatility to it. Yeah, and I think that people that have had experience with rip sticks before that understand the benefits of the carbon tubes, that's an easy transition to CTI. Yeah, I think so, but the, they're so different. Versus TI. I, I just mean, mean ripstick to wingman. Yeah, no, I, I, I get what you mean, but like if you have experience with ripsticks and understand the benefits of carbon tubes, it's yeah. a tougher sell to go to TI. Yeah, that makes sense. You get the, you understand what the benefit is of having the carbon in an Elan ski, especially yep. one that's asymmetrically built and shaped. You pay for it. Yep. So that might be enough reason for some skiers. You totally. Know, those, those carbon rods, they, they tick up the asking price a considerable amount. So. But super high quality product. You know, I think that's yep. a really nice nice selling point. It really is. And I feel like, I mean, I, I, like your end to the 82 mini comparison yep. over there is home to some quite impressive high-end skis. Yep. Like, I think starting here, really, the five skis that we're finishing with are, are, are premium, premium, narrow, all-mountain, wide yep. carving options. Totally. And I think that the that it's a nice move from here at this carbon powered ski to this Fisher, this RC182 GT. And yeah, you can feel the difference. You know, it's definitely got that more substantial feel to it. Um, just more metal in this one. Uh, they do use their nice air carbon core. So they mill out sections of the core just to keep it a little bit lighter. But nice thick metal in here. This is the 0.5. Once yeah. we get to the 86, it moves up to the 0.7 or 0.8, I think. 0.7. Um, but 0.5 is still pretty thick. Pretty thick. So you definitely feel it in terms of it being one of those planted skis. So you can see it. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. It's a big piece of metal in there. Yep. Um, as such, this ski prefers to be rolled edge to edge. You know, it's not like it's the most dynamic and responsive ski out there, but each and every ounce of your energy that you put into it is just directed to the snow. So it's very, very kind of concise in that regard. Uh, the concession for the thickness of the metal are these turn zone areas. So they're stopping the metal here and running it through the spine, but these zones in the tips and tails do not have that metal, and that's just giving it a little bit more approachability. So it's not a huge concession, but... It's a you, necessary one. Yeah, if you picture the opposite way, this full thick metal throughout, you're, then you're dealing with a much wider race ski than you might have anticipated. Yeah, and I've always found that um, RC ones, they do have some versatility to them, but that versatility is only unlocked by like a, a true advanced expert skier. Yeah. Like the first time that I saw somebody doing cool dynamic things on an RC1 was Mike Hatrip on the RC186 GT. Right. And it's like, well, that makes sense because right. he did those things on 2010 straight skis. Yeah. So 210. 210. 210. Yeah. Not 2010. Um, protector binding on this one too, again. A standard option, I, I kind of think. It's like if you're presented with the options of having the safer version that works better and the unsafer. I don't, yeah, I don't know if unsafer that, is fair. Uh, reduced risk of knee injuries. Okay. Bob. But that combined with what we found to be a noticeable kind of drop in stability, yeah. then. This thing's kind of a no-brainer. It is almost a $200 difference yep. from protector to PRD. So yep. I can understand price being the de a determining factor there for somebody. But yeah, I do think as we've found in, in kind of our back-to-back -back rally testing that there is a benefit to having that protector. And I think that benefit comes through on skis like this. Yep. Um, 
here's your turn zone lining up with the rocker, which is <clears throat> not unsubstantial. You know, you're getting that little bit of versatility built in, yeah. you know, so where that turn zone starts is where that rocker starts. And pretty similar in the tail, little brought, little, little bit different, but yeah. pretty flat squared off tail with that metal insert back there. Just really, you know, zeroing in on the finish of the turn, getting you into the next one. <clears throat> and the 166 15 meter radius pretty much lines up well with everything else we have here. Yep, a lot of turn radii in that range on this wall. Here's your outlier though. That is my 18.5. Yeah, this is your straight shooter. <clears throat> yeah, so this is the uh, the Disruption 82 Ti, and like it still feels new-ish to me, but really these have been around for a while now. Yeah. Remember the neon yellow one that you raced on? They were very, very bright. They were very bright. It's yeah. still burned into my retinas. The neon yellow? Yep. I might actually throw some neon yellow footage into into this video. Um, but yeah, this is one of the kind of higher end K2 disruption skis. And do you think it's fair to say that they haven't been as well adopted by the carving enthusiast as K2 would have liked? This is the this is the scariest ski I've been on on this wall. It is in a good way. So fast. Yeah. So I was gonna say the point that I was going to make okay. is is you're you're you you gave me a nice transition. Uh, I don't think they've been as they've been as well adopted by high end carving skiers as K two would have liked, but I don't think that is reflected in their performance. It's a different thing. It's not like Nordica that's using a race thing to base its ski off. Yep. This is a ground up yep. build. And I think they did a really good job with them. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I genuinely think that the design and engineering and build of this ski is really impressive. And when you put a high end skier on them, the things that those high end skiers can do are very, very impressive. And it'll check all their boxes for like demands and, and requirements out of their out of their equipment, but it's so hard to convince that skier to ski a K2 over a Vocal or a Nordica or yeah. a Head or a Fisher. So I just think that that's kind of sad, you know, when a, when a company makes a really good product and you just doesn't seem like they've had a ton of success with it. Yeah, and you know, speaking to my experience, it just like my skills are not where, and I think I skied it in the 185 maybe, 184, 184. whatever the longest length is. I can tell you. And that was too long. Yeah. yeah, too long. And yeah. what's the turn radius in the 184? Does I don't think it, that there? I don't think it says, but okay. it's got to be close to 20. Yeah. So here it is. Uh, I always forget Aspen veneer wood core in this ski, and then Titanal I beam. So we've kind of talked about Titanal I beam at this point a lot. Uh, it's full width underfoot and then kind of just through the center of the ski. They get that dark matter damping, which is pretty similar to RevoShock, you know, similar concept, yep. a, a little piece of carbon floating around and some rubber or something like Elastomer, that. Elastomer, yeah. I feel like, is the nice vague term for that for, stuff. For rubber? Yeah. Elastomer. Elastomer. An elastomer compound. Yeah. Yeah, that does sound fancier than rubber. Um, but anyways, it's it's a real ski and then they get this kind of double sidewall feature underfoot too um, and it, They're stiff. It's pretty darn It's a stiff. pretty rugged ski. Yeah and So at I this mean, width like with this much like totally stuff It's like a wide giant slalom yeah. ski like the turn radius is closer to a giant slalom ski than a lot of things that we've looked at on this wall um, and the shape is like I don't remember what they said, like describing rocker, like four millimeters of rocker, I think in the 82, there's not much, not much. you know, it's kind of, yeah. it's another one of those things where if you decamber it, you see the length, but there's not much splay there and there's no early taper really. So you get a long effective edge and a pretty stiff, pretty heavy ski. It's like, it's considerably heavy. 
Um, and then same thing in the tail. You know, there is tail rocker back here, but like not much, and it's completely squared off. So yeah. they ski long, they ski stiff, and they ski pretty heavy, which for some skiers, none of those things are a good thing. But for those advanced, expert, powerful, strong skiers, this is awesome. Totally. If you're looking for unflinching performance, and I'm just thinking now that it could have easily just have gone right to the end of the wall past Brahma 82. I'm glad you were the one that said that, not me, because yeah. you made the, you put the wall together. Well, sometimes you just think about these things more and then these ideas come up and that's what is fun about these discussions is you get to relive like a scary couple runs on nosedive on these things. Yep. And I never had that experience on the Brahma. Yeah, so I th like Brahma is fun and maybe we can talk more about it when we get there, but like I feel like the the name Brahma, when we say Brahma, we think about 88. Yeah. And the 82, I find much more approachable yeah. and more forgiving than the 88. So we can talk about that in a moment when we get there. But yeah, if you're looking for unlimited carving potential in an 82 underfoot ski, there's, there's genuinely not much better. Yep. Um, stiff boots. Or a must. Yeah, I you think need stiff really... boots and you need to be a strong skier. Yeah. Otherwise, there's no point. Yeah. Um, and I actually find, like, the width is a contributing factor there, too. Like, the MTI, I think, is more approachable for a less aggressive skier. It's just easier to manipulate being yep. narrower with, like, pretty much the same exact build. But when you get up into 82, like, there's a lot of stuff here in a pretty wide ski. Yeah, and, like... I like it, don't get me wrong, but I don't have I don't have what it takes. Yeah, I like it. For me the the hang up that I have is that I don't need that in a ski that's 82 underfoot. I'd I'd rather be over here in Montero AX world with right. a little bit more forgiveness and a little bit more suppleness. But I know that there are skiers out there that that would love that thing. Nope, there are, for sure. And then uh, it's a similar skier to this. Yeah, and this is kind of, let's experience 82. How far, this was one, two, three, four, five, seven skis prior. So big range, yeah. kind of in between the basalt and the TI version. And if you weren't separating by width, I think that experience 82 basalt could have been over here. Right. My side got real messy. Yeah, yeah so, it's the bind of fault. I think I was leaning on them, I think it's my fault. <clears throat> A um, couple of differences construction-wise, but same mold, same footprint as the basalt. So we go from polonia to poplar in the wood core, and then basalt fibers to two sheets of laminate, two sheets of metal, excuse me. So you're getting a stronger performing ski, yeah. a lot damper, a lot more powerful. Not a, not a whole lot of limitations to this thing in terms of performance. Um, we found that to be true about the 86 Ti as well as this 82 Ti where what you put in, you're getting a ton of energy out. Yep. Like it's a very rewarding ski experience. No limits in terms of how hard you can push it. And I think that that's really impressive, especially because I kind of feel like this one falls into the all-mountain-ish range. I, I think it does... I don't think it's as sharp <clears throat> as the Fisher or the Elan when it comes to the shape and the profile. I think that this has a different, a, a different range. I think like the build helps too. Yeah. Like the tip, they're like the swing weight and the tip is a little lighter than any of those skis. Yeah. I mean, that's, <clears throat> that's really it. You know, there's, I really like the Mogul performance here as well. Again, I know you liked it in the 86. 86, too. great. And this is just even better just because it's a little quicker. Yeah. But similar to Declivity where the, the, the metal isn't really a detraction mainly because it has a little bit better of an all-mountain shape. I mean, there's some rocker in the tips and tails. We talked about this with 86 as well where the sidewall goes to cap is where we see that rocker start. So we're, like you were saying, Jeff, with the swing weight. Yeah. That's a factor here where we're using, kind of, you know, not a lot of taper, but it's at least rockered. It's not like 
clasping onto the snow like we see in Rally, where it's like the, it's actively pushing down. Like there's rise here. So that does bring this all mountain format into play. And then same thing in the tail, where sidewall ends, slight rocker begins, and very similar tail shape to declivity, where a little bit of a kick out at the end, but overall, you know, pretty pretty well rounded ski. Yeah. Um, but just a different animal than basalt. <coughs> it really Excuse is. Me. They're quite different. Yeah. So you're just looking at that higher performance ceiling, that higher capability. It's a speed thing again, too. Yeah, you get it going. Yeah, like if you're if you ski fast, get the 82 Ti. If you don't ski fast, get the 82 Basalt. Yeah, it's like pretty clean, easy way to think about it. Yeah. Um, upgrade in the binding on this Connect system here. So slight difference in the binding, but overall very similar. Again, like you said, speed is the big factor. Um, but yeah, in terms of like all mountain performance. This is this is a very high performance and, and really fun ski. I uh, love both the 86 and this. Kind of hard to determine where you go from there. Like you said with the Alans, um, there's not a huge difference between the 82s and the 80. It's four millimeter. It's two edge widths. Yeah, it's not. Like yeah. it's a tiny amount. Yep. So just a little bit of edge to edge quickness, increase in torsional stiffness. Soft and, snow. You yep. can like not not off piece soft snow, just the general conditions of your groomers. I yeah. would kind of focus on that, choosing between them. Yeah. No, I still think this is still a very blurred line ski between front side and all mountain. Yeah. But does it at right. a very high level. Yeah, and I'd say the same thing about the next ski. So I um I don't know when I started thinking about it, but from eighty two, uh I remember when they first came out with this ski and it was around the same time that we had a flat Spitfire yep. 80 and I remember thinking like I'd really love to own a flat Spitfire 80 and like put something like a pivot on it like think about how cool and versatile right. that would be and then I skied this and was like never mind hey hey um hey hey Technica group yeah because you know Blizzard and Nordica under the same parent company. I was like, you don't need to make a flat Spitfire 80 like this is, this is achieving the yeah. exact same thing and not achieving the exact same thing, but achieving what I thought I was looking for in a, in a flat Spitfire. High end carving performance, not much limit to torsional stiffness or how hard you can push it, but being able to mount it with a flat binding you can ski it in the moguls yeah and you have like this versatility and, and creativity on a ski that has you know like its carving potential is not far off from like a super shaped rally you know they feel different yeah. but like limits to edge grip or limits to like overall stability at speed like there's not a huge difference between those two skis so if you want super high end carving performance you still want something that's pretty darn quick edge to edge, but you want a little bit of creativity, then I think that's where the Brahma 82 comes into play. And, and I think it's awesome. And I think it's like, it's kind of one of those things where I feel like you could probably say that more people should ski this than a Brahma 88. Especially if your application is more on trail. Right, right. Like 88's kind of this weird, yeah. weird zone for a, groomer ski where it's not like nearly as quick edge to edge as something like this so it's like if carving if groomers is your focus then why not right why not go here and you know like brahma 82 and rustler 9 pretty sweet little two ski quiver there and you're kind of like wrapping right around the brahma 88 for right. widths so i just think the brahma 82 is really cool and kind of like what we were saying, um, I find it easier to ski than the 88. It's not like, you know, it's it's still stiff ski, still that true blend wood core, two sheets of metal, two and two and a, I don't know if I, I can confidently say two and a half yeah. in this ski. So maybe not quite as much metal as a Brahma 88, but still a good amount of metal in this ski. Um, so there's plenty of ski here. You mentioned moguls and 
like the way I think about the ski and bumps is I don't get to ski it the way that I want to ski it in the moguls, but I can ski it how it wants, it to, be wants to be skied or how it should be skied. You know, there's definitely not a whole lot of zipper line potential as there is in declivity or blaze or uh, stance. Just not as much quickness. It's just, it's tough. Yeah. Tough to wrangle. Yep. You know, like anyone that's skied a Brahma before knows that it gets better the faster it goes. And that's true for 82 and 88. And in the moguls, that's not a very safe mindset. Yeah, that's fair. So this works. You have to ski it slower because yeah. it, it's super stiff and strong. Yeah. And unless you're elite and super strong skier, it's right. very difficult to handle. Well, and maybe that's why I like it in the moguls. Right. Because the subtle, like, taper and just roundness to its shape, it does, it lets you yeah. ski kind of slower speed, release the tail edge, ski it a tiny yeah. bit. It's methodical. Like, you yeah. have to ski it methodically in the bumps. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's not, it doesn't have just endless all mountain and free ride potential. Like, this, I would much rather ski this in the bumps and trees any day of the week than, a than this 82. Trees especially. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is one of those ones that is going to pretty darn plant it's going to hold on. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I'd want to ski this in the trees at all. Yeah. But a nice like well set mogul line. But steep groomers that are firm that we see a lot of here whether you're talking about Great. lift line nose dive hay ride like coming over the waterfall pitch on something like this. Yeah. Total confidence. Yep. And and it doesn't it's not going to take you out like a K2. Like no, this shape. you can at least manipulate. The shape and being a flat ski, just lower center of gravity. I'm moving this over. It gives you a little bit more kind of suppleness to its performance. Yeah. You're making that decision. I'm making this decision. Okay. You heard it here first. <laughs> a Brahma 82 is easier to ski than a uh, disruption, disruption 82, 82 Ti. That's it. I could argue with you with the experience 82, though. You want to move this over here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not, I don't have a problem with that. I think this experience in the Fisher does line up really well together. Yeah. They're friends. Yeah. So, anyways, that was fun. Yeah. Bob, any profound thoughts? I feel like this has been really long. Do you have anything that you want to close with? Not really. Just that I think that there's a lot of interesting discussions to be had in this line and we've talked about it a few times to mix blending wide front side and narrow all mountain and yeah. making that decision i think is super helpful and yeah kind of winnowing away half to three quarters of skis on this wall a lot of subtle nuances up here yeah which is fun to talk through totally and, and probably doesn't doesn't come through on paper yeah so a fun a fun discussion to have um, we will do another front side comparison. So in the next one, we'll be going 74 and narrower. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, <clears throat> as usual, if there's anything that you have questions about up here or any skis that, are, that could be included in this category that we didn't fit onto this wall, um, just let us know and, and happy to, to chat more about it. Totally. So yeah, a couple more 2024 ski comparisons to come. Keep your eyes peeled. And we'll see you out there on the slopes because we're skiing in two days. A couple days. Yeah. Yeah. Bye.